Well, folks, today we're going to be talking about Zelda Echoes of Wisdom because Nintendo did a very interesting interview series where the Zelda developers behind the game revealed a ton of fascinating stuff. There's a three-part interview. We're going to go through the entire interview together, so, you know, strap in. We'll put some time stamps to some of the more interesting questions and some of my responses to it. But, guys, I'm really excited because this is the week Echoes of Wisdom comes out. I already have it preloaded and ready to go for my Switch. We will be live streaming Echoes of wisdom at some point uh thursday morning so i hope you're really excited for that that being said uh if you enjoy this content you want to stay tuned for all the zelda news out there the switch 2 stuff and everything in between all you have to do is go ahead and subscribe to the channel and help us on our road to 150,000 subscribers all right let's go ahead and head on over to this interview you see this is actually posted over at the nintendo website the said it is an ask the developer series really happy that nintendo continues to do stuff like this and you see it's between uh the senior officer of the whole franchise in A.G. Aonuma. Uh, you'll see that it's also between the Entertainment Planning and Developer uh, Department Production Group number three, Tomami Sano. I'm, I, I probably butchered that one. And then the director from Grezzo Company, Satoshi Tarada. All right. So let's go down here and you'll see it's got three sections. Here's part one. Uh, it says, first, could you briefly introduce yourself? So A.G. Aonuma says, uh, he's going to be referred to as Aonuma from now on. Hello, I'm A.G. Aonuma, the producer of the Legend of Zelda series. For this game, we ask Rezo, the experienced game development studio that has worked for many years on remakes of games for the Legend of Zelda series to create an entirely new Zelda game. We collaborated to complete the project. As the producer, I played the game from the player's perspective and continued to provide feedback. Tomomi Sano referred as Sano from this point on. Hi, I'm Tomomi Sano. I was the director for this title from the Nintendo side. My role was to manage and coordinate the production for this project, suggest adjustments, and then check the outcome to ensure the gameplay created by Grezzo is aligned with the Legend of Zelda series. And by the way, shout out to Tomomi Sano. She is the first ever female director of a Zelda game. So that's really cool. It's really just about who the best person for the job is. Uh, Satoshi Tarada said, hello, I am Satoshi Tarado from Grezzo. I originally started out as a designer, mainly doing terrain design and level design, but this is the first time I directed a project. I first got involved with the Legend of Zelda series on the remake of the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. In the previous project, the remake of Link's Awakening, I was in charge of development of the art style, 3D backgrounds, and lighting. This is the first time Grezzo worked on a brand new game in the Legend of Zelda series, which isn't entirely true, but they're really trying to forget that Triforce Heroes was a thing that happened. Thank you. By the way, Sano-san is the first female director of the Legend of Zelda series. What other titles have you worked on in the past? Sano says, prior to this project, my main role was to support the director. For the remakes that Grezzo worked on, I was involved with The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time 3D, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask 3D, and The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. I was invo also involved with The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess HD, as well as some titles in the Mario and Luigi series, released prior to Mario and Luigi Brothership which will be released in November of this year. So you can kind of see where she came from. She came from Alpha Dream, essentially, but then worked on a whole bunch of these other titles over the years with Nintendo. All right, so moving on. Uh, we get down to the next response from Anuma. I almost always ask her to be engaged in the Legend of Zelda remakes that Grezzo works on. So she's been the go-to uh, for Anuma in terms of helping out Grezzo with stuff. So uh, she definitely was in the right position to be a director here because she's been working with this team for many, many years. All right, so the question goes, I see. So Sano-san is an essential part of the Legend of Zelda game develops with Grezzo. So Anuma-san, could you please tell us what kind of game this is? Aonuma. Of course, The Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom is a brand new top-down Legend of Zelda game that revolves around Princess Zelda as the main protagonist. Mysterious rifts appear in the Kingdom of Hyrule. People, objects, and even the King of Hyrule and Link are swallowed up by the rifts. The story centers on Princess Zelda, who sets out on an adventure with the ethereal creature Tri, creating imitations of various objects to save the people of Hyrule. Zelda can wave a wand, known as the Tri-Rod, to create copies of objects such as tables that she can use as platforms to go up to higher places or copies of monsters to fight for her. We named these imitated creations Echoes and packed in all sorts of new ways to play using them. Thank you. The You use the phrase, a brand new top-down Legend of Zelda game. What led to the development of a new game this time? Aonuma. 
Actually, I've always wanted to establish a 2D top-down Legend of Zelda series that's separate from the 3D entries like Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. You know what's really hot? hot. You know what's really funny about that statement? That's literally what everything was until, until Breath of the Wild. Uh, they had a separate top-down team, and they had a console team. It's kind of funny that he's like, well, you know, ever since Breath of the Wild, I've always wanted separate teams. And yet, like, they had separate teams before Breath of the Wild. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of funny. Anyways, uh, the game style and how it feels are completely different when the world is viewed in 3D from behind the character to when the world is viewed from a top-down perspective. We wanted to cherish that kind of diversity in the Legend of Zelda series. Amid all of this, we felt that the remake of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening on Nintendo Switch, which we developed with Grezzo, had become our new approach in terms of graphics and gameplay feel as a top-down Legend of Zelda game for the Nintendo Switch generation. Grezzo had established an excellent way of reviving the top-down Legend of Zelda experience for a modern era, so I thought we could develop something completely new that had never been done before. So yeah, they did a great job with Link's Awakening, essentially. So because they did a great job with Link's Awakening, they figured, hey, this is a great direction for a new title on Switch. That's really when it began. Um, you know, hey, let's get working on this. Uh, so the question goes, most of the Legend of Zelda games that Grezzo had worked on until this game were remakes. Since you were creating a new title, a uh, new game this time, did that significantly change how Nintendo and Grezzo worked together? Aonuma, yes. There was naturally quite a lot that changed. To mention a major change, at the start of development, we asked Grezzo employees to pitch internally their ideas for this new Legend of Zelda game. More specifically, we asked Grezzo, if you were to make the next new game, what kind of game would you like it to be? We had the opportunity to hear ideas from members of Grezzo, which they came up with freely and proposed. Tarada responds, It was a big event for Grezzo. After all the remakes we had been working on, this was the first time we were challenged with a new game project from the conceptual stage. There was even a time when every single one of Grezzo's employees was thinking about ideas. Laughs. Thanks to this, we came up with so many ideas that it took us three days just to go over and review them. Since it was a Legend of Zelda project, everyone worked hard on proposals and presented them in front of Aonuma-san with pounding hearts. Laugh. So yeah, kind of a nerve-wracking moment, right? Aonuma responds, I worked with Grezzo for a long time, though. He also laughs. But then when we were working on remakes, we didn't really get the chance to hear everyone's ideas. This time, we asked everyone, not only the project planners for the game, but also the designers and programmers to come up with lots of ideas. Sano responds, dozens of people participated, and even though they didn't brainstorm together or anything like that, surprisingly, a number of similar ideas were proposed. But that's not a bad thing at all. I think everyone had a common idea of something they wanted to do in a game, and it just perfectly suited the world of The Legend of Zelda. Torado responds, So we went through the ideas that came out of the pitch and picked out a variety that looked good. From there, we decided to move forward with a focus on copy and paste gameplay and gameplay that combines top-down view and side view. Then Onuma responds, These were the two basic elements, and from there, I asked them to think of a way to add some freedom. Having worked on games in the Legend of Zelda series over the years, we started to feel that many fans may not continue playing this franchise unless they can think independently and try various things freely on their own, rather than following a set path. Even when it comes to solving puzzles. In a game, the Legend of Zelda series, having the excitement of solving puzzles in your own unique way makes the game The Legend of Zelda-like, which is very fascinating. Um, that is not the way The Legend of Zelda has been over the years. Most Zelda games, or most things you would say are Zelda-like, had one solution. Quite fascinating how uh, now it's only Zelda-like if you can do it your way. I, I really enjoy that style of gameplay, but it's kind of interesting because that's not the way the series has always been. Um, hence, we need to increase the degree of freedom to achieve that. With this in mind, I ask Grezzo to use those two elements as a foundation for the gameplay and add freedom on top of it. So... New question here. After the large-scale pitch for ideas, two foundations were set. What kind of gameplay did that translate to? Tarada. We were exploring a few different ways to play the game in parallel. In one approach, Link could copy and paste various objects, such as doors and candlesticks, to create original dungeons. During this exploration phase, this idea was called an edit dungeon, because players could create their own Legend of Zelda gameplay. That's right, everyone. Dungeon Maker from Link's Awakening, got expanded upon into a new thing. Pretty interesting. Uh, Numa responds, They showed it to me and told me to give it a try. As I played, I started thinking that while it's fun to create your own dungeon and let people play it, it's also not so bad to place items that can be copied and pasted in the game field and create a gameplay where they can be used to fight enemies. 
That was the beginning of the gameplay using Echoes. The gameplay was shifted from creating dungeons up until then to using copy and pasted items as tools to further your own adventure. Now, what I find really fascinating about this one is while they obviously, Grezzo was like, hey, let's lean into this whole dungeon making idea. It was actually Al Numa that flipped the tea table, so to speak. Like, remember when Miyamoto was famous for flipping the tea table on gameplay ideas? Well, Al Numa, while he was mostly involved just as somebody playing the game and giving you feedback, his feedback here was like, hey, man, this is really cool, but I think it would be even better if instead of making dungeons, you copy-pasted items into the game world. And uh, that's obviously one of the driving forces behind the game and all the echoes. So Al Numa, while he obviously wasn't like super hands-on with the project, he did provide the core idea uh, that led to what Echoes of Wisdom is. So never underestimate uh, the importance of a series producer and their fundamental understanding of what makes a good game. All right, so we get into this next question and say, I see, so that's an idea of using Echoes was developed. Did you make this change in gameplay early in development? Aonuma, uh... <laughs> Aonuma is just like, uh, yeah, no, I can't, I'm not gonna answer this, but no, it wasn't right away. <laughs> Anyways, Sino says, it's been about a year since we started prototyping with the edit dungeon idea. Tarada, it's been that long. Sino, upending the tea table after a year. Last, I told you guys. I told you guys. Aonuma was like, yeah, actually, they've been working on this pretty hardcore for a year. And he's like, yeah, no. Throw that in the trash. <laughs> oh, I love Aonuma, man. He was, I wonder how it feels for him to now be in the Miyamoto role for the Zelda series. It's got to be quite the... Um, you know, chair turner, as it were. Anyways, Alnuma says, everyone else was developing the game with a dungeon creation in mind, but I was right next to them thinking of something different. Laughs. There was a reason it took a year to upend the tea table. After all, you can't really see the potential for ideas to develop into solid gameplay until you can verify the features and their feel. So I wanted them to try making it first. I felt that the edit dungeon feature they showed me had significant potential to be developed into a new way of playing the Legend of Zelda games if the gameplay was changed to use Echoes instead. So I thought it would be good to expand in that direction and could even be more interesting that way. However, there was one concern. Even though game consoles have larger memory capacity nowadays, the more things players can copy and paste, the more game memory is used up. I was really worried that it would cause the game to crash. Which, there's Onuma saying that, you know what, the Switch has limitations. We were running into limitations with Switch. He was really worried that the copy ability was going to lead to memory problems, RAM issues. Uh, kind of nice for uh, Onuma to recognize that, hey, you know what? Things weren't, aren't exactly 100% perfect with Switch. We would actually like a new system. Like, if, if, if the Zelda producer is acting like the Switch isn't powerful enough, you kind of know it's time for what's next. Anyways, uh, but here's the question. But wasn't it you, Aonuma-san, despite that concern, who ultimately made the decision to upend the tea table? Aonuma, it certainly was. Laughs. But I thought we could make something more interesting if we pushed harder. I wasn't sure how far we could go, but in the end, it was amazing to see how many echoes it was possible to create in the game. It must have been difficult to manage the game memory. Sano says, I did notice from the very beginning that copying new things is a lot of fun in itself. The edit dungeon concept involved copying various things during your adventure out on the game field, then bringing them back to create a dungeon in the dedicated space. Uh, or place. When I was on the adventure of collecting things to copy, I noticed that if I pasted something that was only present in the side view perspective into a location with a top-down perspective, it worked just fine. In 2D games, even if an object looks the same, it's often made and used completely different between top-down view and side view, but Grezzo created a single object that would function in both views. All right, next question. The same object can be used in multiple points of views. Yes, in the same subject or in the same object, it seems to work differently when you look at it from another angle, which is interesting for us. As an example, in The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, there is an enemy called Thwomp that falls from above and crushes things below, only appears in the side view perspective. If you copy that and paste it into the top view, you could drop it from above and crush things below. Or conversely, you can ride on the Thwomp and use it to climb upwards. It gives a little gameplay example here from, uh, you know, development here. See, look at that. Pretty interesting, huh? Pretty interesting. All right. Uh, I was surprised to see that even though the functions are the same, you can use it in new ways just by changing the viewing angle. Onuma, that felt outrageously fun. Sano, I thought to myself, wow, I never knew this was possible. Of course, creating dungeons was fun, but being able to copy the very various objects and use them in different places was even more fun. All right, next question. 
What are the developers at Grezzles conscious of combining top-down views and side views, even when prototyping the edit dungeon gameplay? Tarada. After we finished developing the remake of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, we, we really liked its world. So we talked with Nintendo about creating the edit dungeon concept, which we were prototyping back then, in a similar vein. Since the remake of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening... Uh, had areas with both top-down and side views. Naturally, everyone at Grezzo assumed from the start that we would create both a top-down and side view in this title. However, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening is set on an island with a smaller map size and was a remake, so it was limited in terms of what could be added during development. So for this new game, we created the prototype with the idea of expanding on what we wanted to do. Aonuma, when you encountered a thwomp in a side-scrolling game, it looks like a thin rectangle. As you can see, not only the front of it, but when you look at it from a different angle, it looks like a giant rock that makes a loud crashing sound when it falls. Its presence as an object is completely altered. Sano, or Sano. Even if you use the exact same function, changing your perspective can help you better understand how to use it. A question like, how high does this object go up and down, is easier to check with the side view, and how big is this object has a clearer answer with the top-down view. As we progressed through development, we felt that the changes in perspective made it twice as satisfying. All right, now we get to part two where we're being a little mischievous. So, it sounds like you can create echoes of a lot of different things in this game. How did you approach creating roles for each of them? Did you set any kind of rules when coming up with the ideas? Tarada, we struggle with the ideas for echoes since the gameplay involves copying and pasting things that you find in the game field. They had to be something that can both help and hinder you. They also need to work both in a top-down and side-view perspective. Aonuma, when you're fighting an enemy, it's advantageous for them to be weak. But if you want to make them your ally, you'd prefer if they put up more of a fight. Naturally, you'll want to have strong allies who could fight by your side, but you'll need to defeat them first. If you couldn't make them your ally, then there would be no point in having them in the game. But if you recruit one that's too strong, they'd be able to defeat enemies on their own, making other echoes seem inferior. It's challenging to find the right balance. Tarada. If an echo is too useful, then it's unlikely you'd use everything else. We wanted to encourage players to try out lots of different things using a variety of echoes. Next statement here, question. You also had to consider the top-down view and side-view perspectives when developing the Echoes gameplay, too. Anuma said the water blocks were especially tricky, and I got a little gameplay sample here with the water blocks, kind of showing some in-development footage. Pretty interesting uh, what they're doing here with the water blocks, obviously swimming up um, and, and all that. They're going to show it in the overworld as well, where you can build a tower of them. We've seen some of this gameplay before, but it's pretty cool just to see some, some fresh stuff here. All right. For the side view, it's fine to simply represent a flat water surface, but for the top down, it will be represented in 3D, so we need to create a cube-shaped water object that appears in the game field. Also, the player has to be able to go inside the water block and swim. We found a way to connect the blocks vertically and horizontally, but when you swam inside, you would fall out from the connections between them. It wasn't working at all, laughs Tarada. It certainly was a challenge. Laughs. Everyone, ha 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 ha. Tarada. Then, even if we manage to find the right balance between enemy and ally and between top-down and side views, we also need to consider all the different places where players might use their echoes. Aonuma. Like, what happens if you meet a monster in the snowy mountains and then create an echo of it in a volcano? It was a lot of work to ensure that things worked consistently and that the game wouldn't fall apart if players used an echo in an area different from the one where they found it. All right, next question. Even just for one single echo, there are so many scenarios you need to account for. And there are over 100 echoes in the game, right? Over 100. Holy crud. Tarada. Exactly. There are so many echoes at your disposal, we made sure to give each one a specific characteristic so that players would remember what each one does. We wanted players to be able to remember off the top of their heads which echo to use in certain situations. Sano. Having the freedom to solve puzzles by yourself is a key feature of the Legend of Zelda games, but having too much freedom can leave you feeling stumped. We made a conscious effort to clearly define the functions of each echo so the players understand how and where they should be used. We were mindful of designing it so that players could reach the gameplay elements we wanted them to experience without getting lost and confused. Which, some people might argue that's a positive thing in game development, but, you know, to each their own. Now, next statement. Indeed, there won't be much point in having so many echoes if you couldn't make use of them. Sano. Also, Princess Zelda doesn't have a way of attacking directly initially, so there was a tendency for the gameplay to using the echoes to just end up being a situation where you watch the things you copied do the work. It felt like they were doing everything for you and you were being made to wait. So we asked Grezzo to adjust it so that players would feel an immediate sense of accomplishment, like, I did it, for example. If you made an echo of a monster, that echo would immediately attack an enemy, just like you swinging a sword. Or if you wanted to 
you know, light a fire. You can use an echo with that ability and it would light the fire straight away. We made adjustments like this all the way through the game's development so that these kinds of intuitive responses would feel exciting for the players. Aonuma. Speaking of which, didn't the bind ability also come from feeling the excitement that comes with moving things? Um, and, you know, they show some examples of bind here uh, that we haven't seen. Some new gameplay here. I'm just kind of showing, you know, moving a rock, solving puzzles. You're probably going to jump on that uh, to get across that gap, I'm assuming, right? Uh, that's probably probably the idea there. Uh, and then here's one where you grab the platform. We've seen this before in other footage. All right. So Sano responds, it's an ability that lets you bind with an object to have copy uh, have a copy of your movements. Conversely, you can also bind yourself to an object to mirror its movements in the same way. Aonuma, there's a trick to moving things you're bound to, and this is one of the action elements of the game. Now, the next statement, not really a question, says... With not only echoes, but also the bind feature, it must have taken a lot of effort to make all this work and realize the number of possibilities without breaking the gameplay. Tarada says it did. At the beginning of the game's development, we were thinking a lot about restrictions on gameplay, assuming that certain things would definitely break the game mechanics or stop the game from working properly. We had ideas like limiting to only using 20 echoes in a dungeon. Lots of ideas like these made it so you could only, you know, so you couldn't do things you had previously done, but it would have been frustrating for the players if they couldn't use a solution that worked in a previous situation. So one day we decided to scrap that approach and not impose any restrictions. That's right. No restrictions on your echoes, guys. Alnuma says, I used to believe that the theory behind games was that being set loose from restraints gives a feeling of freedom and growth. That's why old games were designed to slowly lift the restrictions that were there at the start. For a long time, game developers like ourselves made games while firmly believing this theory to be right, and we felt safe creating restrictions in line with it. However, the Echoes gameplay could fly in the face of this theory at times. When you're actually playing, it can be more fun not having the restrictions in the first place. And so we asked ourselves, what do we want to do about this one? Shall we remove it? And then gradually began removing those restrictions. Over time, most of the restrictions we thought were necessary at the start of development were no longer needed. It even led us to allow things that we were worried at first would provide too much freedom. It's strange, isn't it? It's almost as if introducing some freedom attracted even more freedom. Next statement. So by removing the restrictions you put in place, the game became something with an extremely high level of freedom as a result. In other words, the right balance came together over the course of development. Tarada. Speaking of which, there was also a key phrase we used during development. Being mischievous. Being mischievous? Aonuma. We came up with this key phrase because we wanted to do some things that were really out there. For example, if you roll something like a spike roller along the ground, that's a lot of work because it can hit all kinds of things. But if we didn't allow for this possibility, it wouldn't be fun. Laughs. The development team called these kind of ideas being mischievous. Sano. We created a document explaining what being mischievous meant so that everyone could return to this concept if they were sure how to proceed. Tarada. There were three rules. Being able to paste things, however, wherever and whenever you like. Make it possible to complete puzzles and using things that aren't there. Sano, and a third, being able to find uses for echoes that are so ingenious it almost felt like cheating should be part of what makes this game fun. Next statement. Oh, there's a small note written in a document about remembering the Mayam Agana shrine from Breath of the Wild. Sano, ah, this is the shrine. You have to guide the ball across the board with obstacles to reach the goal. However, before the ball drops onto the board, you can flip the entire board over and use the obstacle free surface on the other side to complete the challenge with ease. Tarada, it just slides effortlessly into the goal. Laughs. Aonuma, it's like finding a secret trick in the game, just like the old days. It's kind of a solution. Isn't allowed, then it's not fun. Also, when we developed Tears of the Kingdom, we talked about how the player can kind of cheat in many places. I'm always happy when I manage to solve something in an unexpected way, doing something where I'm not sure if it's even okay to do it. Like that, I guess it ties in with the idea of being mischievous. On to part three, everyone. Part three, Princess Zelda is on her own adventure. An important element of this game is that for the first time in the Legend of Zelda series, Princess Zelda is the protagonist of her own adventure. Aonuma, we were initially thinking that Link would be the protagonist, but when we focused on the gameplay using echoes and had Link copying and pasting things into the game field, the sword and shield got in the way. If you have a sword and shield, you can just fight using those things. There's no need to rely on monster powers, right? Tarada said, so we thought, what if players could only use echoes at first in order to understand the gameplay? And then as the game progresses, they get the sword and the shield. But even then, we thought that once they got the sword and shield, they would stop using echoes. So Anuma says, that's just your typical Legend of Zelda game. 
What are we going to do? Laughs. Tarada says, Echoes plus a sword and shield. They just didn't work well together. There's a wide variety of Echoes, so to get the most out of the gameplay, we decided to stick with Echoes only. Aonuma responds, If that's the case, it must be someone who doesn't fight with a sword and shield, right? Who in the series would be a good fit for these powers and bring their insight to them? Well, that would have to be Princess Zelda. Next question says, But didn't it take a lot of courage to make Princess Zelda the protagonist for the first time in the series, given its long history? Aonuma says, Over the years, we've been working with the Legend of Zelda series. Many people have often asked us, Will Princess Zelda ever be the protagonist? And I said, I'd like to play as Princess Zelda. When asked this question, I've always thought, of course, as long as it makes sense for the game and does justice to her as a character to be the protagonist, and answered that way. I had been trying in vain to figure out what would really do justice to her? But then I saw the team struggling to identify an ideal protagonist for this game. I thought this is exactly the game for her. I see. So you finally had an opportunity to answer this long debated question. Aonuma. That being said, we had a lot of trouble deciding on Princess Zelda's outfit. For example, since she is going on an adventure, we did consider giving her some more typical adventure clothing. Yet we wondered if it looked strange to have such an outfit ready, as if she was already known that she'd previously been leaving from the get-go. We tried looking for a suitable outfit for Princess Zelda from previous games as well, but couldn't find anything that really clicked. But I see you eventually landed on a hood. Tarada. That's the hood that Link wears at the beginning of the game, and it's there to represent Link, who has become strong after many adventures. Aonuma. So when I was shown Link's new outfit for his title, it occurred to me. Princess Zelda goes on a journey secretly, so wouldn't it make sense if she wears a hood as well? Ah... So it's not like you thought putting a hood on Link because Princess Zelda will be wearing one later, but rather, Link was initially designed with the hood. Sano. Correct. And we thought it would be touching if Princess Zelda inherited the hood that Link wore. Aonuma. One of the themes for Princess Zelda this time was to find Link. So we thought that her wearing the hood would be a good reminder of her purpose to find him. By the way, I mentioned earlier how the sword and shield got in the way of the Echoes gameplay, but we still wanted to implement gameplay that used the sword and shield. So we thought it would make sense as Zelda imitated Link's abilities using Echoes, and that's how the sword fighter form came about. I see. A lot of things have come out of the relationship between Link and Zelda, since it seems like there are a lot of things to consider with Princess Zelda as the main character. What went into the story's development? Aonuma. Well, first it was difficult to find a motive to send Princess Zelda on an adventure. In Link's case, he is destined to be a hero, so if there are monsters, he sets out on a journey to defeat them. And that makes sense. But in the case of Princess Zelda, as she's royalty, we needed to be careful and craft the right setting of why she really needs to leave her castle when there are people around her who can fight. Tarada. But the more we thought about it, the harder it was to come up with a convincing enough reason for Princess Zelda to leave for an adventure. And they laugh. Aonuma, just having monsters roaming around Hyrule wouldn't be enough to motivate Princess Zelda to directly fight them. We tried brainstorming all sorts of ideas for what kind of situation would necessitate that the princess takes matters into her own hands. Tarada, one staff member, as if Princess Zelda was her own child, said, We can't send the princess on an adventure yet. I'd go instead of these circumstances. They laugh together. Aonuma. So we eventually decided that the setting of this game would involve lots of large, mysterious rifts appearing in Hyrule. We had to come up with something that wasn't a monster, but something that would make Princess think, this is bad. I have to do something. A princess is a daughter of a ruler of a country. So I thought the motivation to fight is that the world of Hyrule is being destroyed and changed. Sasano says, even when we decided to make rifts as part of the game setting, the design was still a challenge. The story is that inside the rifts lies the still world where people and things go when they're swallowed up. No one has ever seen a place like that. It's easy to say, the ground cracked and below that is a world of void. But the designers from Grezzo, who had developed those ideas into visuals, were scratching their heads with questions like, how do the rifts expand? And how deep do they go? And how do we show the transition between the game field and the world of the void? laughs Tarada, and since they appear in various places around hyrule they need to be able to be placed anywhere including on the ground on top of buildings on water or in lava we had to keep in mind that the placements of the risk changed based on level design or that the risk could appear or disappear at any time at different points in the story it was extremely difficult to create something visually new under such restrictions there's a mysterious space inside the rifts that's different from the regular world. Anuma says, I didn't want to depict anything too cruel in a world where the main protagonist isn't a fighter per se, but I still need to deliver a sense of danger approaching Hyrule. It was quite challenging to create that. Sano. We also had a hard time developing the scene in which the king is swallowed by a rift, which is one of Princess Zelda's biggest motivations for setting out on her journey. Tarada. Though creating the initial world setting was difficult, we also thought about what role Link would play in the game. 
What would happen to the sword if the gameplay focused on echoes? Can this character even exist in this game? The Legend of Zelda series has a grand historical lineage. How should I put it? How far should we delve into the lore of the Legend of Zelda? There is a certain history of Hyrule that ties the entire series together. If you take too many liberties, you have to be careful whether it's still Legend of Zelda-like. Alnuma responds, right, it's very difficult to balance how much to add or change. At first, we were intentionally leaving any parts that might delve into Hyrule's history vague, but partway through, we just couldn't find a way to move forward that way. So around last summer, man, this still wasn't too long ago, guys, we decided to hold a boot camp and work out the story there. Tarada says, it truly was a boot camp, indeed. Aonuma, even there, Grezzo didn't offer any in-depth suggestions about the story at first. So I went back to the hotel, quickly wrote a script that would work, and brought it with me the next day. Then we all contributed various elements that often occur in the Legend of Zelda series to the script. Using this method, we eventually completed the game's story. Man, they really mean it, guys, when they add the story after they develop the whole game. Holy crud. All right, I'll get back into this here. Uh... Over a few sessions, says Sana, we spent nine days at the boot camps in total, working from morning until night. Onuma, these days, even for us, it's not easy to touch on the lore of the Legend of Zelda series. When you address the history of the Legend of Zelda, you naturally have to be conscious of how things have been expressed previously in the series. When we think about a new game, we need to think about new developments while being mindful of the past games in the series. So the scope of what you can do becomes increasingly narrow if you think the same way every time. On top of that, because the series has been running for so long, players are interested in its history and lore. So when we've adopted the game plot that was not in line with other games in the series, because we prioritize the gameplay, we've been told by our fans that it didn't make sense. We realize that even if the developers didn't intend to make nonsensical changes, players can interpret otherwise. I see. So the developers need to take those kind of players' reactions into consideration when creating a story. Aonuma, even with this title, we had no intention of establishing any new theories in the Zelda series lore. Link goes on an adventure every time and experiences many things, but Princess Zelda has always had to take a step back. This time, Princess Zelda is on her own adventure. So the story takes place on a different perspective than before, and I think that's why we were able to create something new in terms of the story as well. So it is interesting that they do take it into consideration, obviously, the prior story of the games. They still refuse to put Echoes of Wisdom somewhere on the timeline. Uh, it, it's part of the series, but maybe it's its own timeline. Maybe they just want to leave it up to the player. I don't know, guys. I hope you really enjoyed that interview, though. It does look like part four is going to be available tomorrow. Who knows what part four is going to bring, but I wanted to get you guys all the way through part three and caught up. Uh, let me know what you think about Echoes of Wisdom right now down in the comments below. Are you really excited for this game coming out, or are you kind of in a, eh, I'll pass? For me, day one, baby. We'll be live streaming this thing at some point Thursday morning. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your day. We'll catch you tonight on our live stream at 8 p.m. Central Time, and who knows? Maybe there'll be a bonus video today. Kind of depends on how the news goes, right? Catch you guys in the next video.